Anyway, if you like cults, or islands, or ice, read Cat's Cradle. Can we get to the stabby stab with the, you know, the, you know, can, can we? Cool. Ready? Rolling. Hey, how y'all doing? It's Shay, and today I'm going to be reviewing all the books that I read during my swapping screen time with reading challenge. Also, something to note, in my swapping screen time video, I said that I read nine books total. Yeah, uh, ADHD symptoms hitting real hard there, Shay, when we're forgetting things that are no longer right in front of us, because I forgot to count Cat's Cradle, because I didn't have it with me at the time, because after I finished reading it, I returned it to the library. So I actually read 10 books. First book we're going to start with is The Big Boy, Utopia Avenue by David Mitchell. My best friend got me this book a while back and I've been meaning to read it and just now got around to it. Sorry. But I really did enjoy it. I think I rated this four out of five stars. This book follows a rock band in 1960s Britain and it is a roller coaster. Honestly, I wasn't sure how I felt about this book when I first started it because the writing style is not something that I'm used to because I'm not used to reading this type of fiction much anymore. I've been on a fantasy kick for a long time. So getting used to the more, I hate to say contemporary because it's not contemporary, but I guess more modern fiction type of writing was hard for me to get used to again. I didn't hate it. It was just a little bit of an adjustment period. But then once I started getting the ball rolling, started getting into the story, I picked it up really quickly. Something to note right off the bat, if you are sensitive to homophobia, don't read this book. I don't think it's on part of the author. I don't think the author is homophobic or anything like that, not to my knowledge. It's just that it does take place in 1960s Britain and one of the main characters, which is not a spoiler because I'm not going to tell you who it is, is gay and there was a lot of homophobia in that time. So I think it is accurate. That still doesn't make me comfortable. <laughs> I don't think it's overdone. I don't think it's over exaggerated. I don't think it's a consistently punching down way of expressing it. I think the way that it is presented is possibly accurate for the time period. It's just that if you're sensitive, especially to slurs, that's something that you should be aware of in this book. Otherwise, I like this book the more and more I read it. I related to each character in a different way, which I found really unique. The way this book is set up is each chapter is basically a different member of the band living their life. And something that the author did that I love in regards to the characters and their development is that they were all interconnected, but they were all still individuals. When you're in a band or you're in a group of people that consistently work together or are around each other, you get to know each other pretty darn well. But it's not like they are mind readers of each other in this book. What I appreciate is all of the band members, all of the characters in this book, still have their own personal lives and elements of their lives that none of the others really know anything about yet you can still see how close they are. So they may not know who the other person is dating, but they know the look on the other person's face that says, I hate the taste of this soup, even though their mouth is saying, I love this soup, if that makes sense. I find that refreshingly realistic as someone who has spent most of my life working in close-knit groups like that, because you really do become interwoven in each other's lives to a certain aspect. Your schedules may revolve around each other. A lot of your interactions obviously will revolve around each other. Your social lives revolve around each other. But they're not 100% your life. You're still going to have elements of your life that remain private that they have nothing to do with. Yet, in some ways, they're going to know you more intimately than anyone else does. I think this book showcases that really well. Lastly, as a creative person myself, not just a person who works in the music industry, I appreciated the creative process and how it was described and portrayed in this book because that's something that I've always found really hard to nail down in words or thoughts. I've had plenty of people ask me, like, Shay, how do you come up with the writing ideas? How do you come up with your story ideas? Or the dialogue that you come up with? How do you come up with that melody? And I don't really have an answer. There are some things that sometimes inspire me. I'll hear something or I'll be like, yeah, that train horn inspired me. But most of the time, it's hard to explain to people because it really does just come from nowhere. Sometimes I'll just be sitting here and a line of dialogue will just pop into my head and I don't know where it came from, but it's here now. It's hard to explain it to them because they don't understand where it comes from and neither do we. It just appears. It's sort of like the wind. It just... It's here now.
for example, one of the characters in this book, Jasper, I believe it is, if I can find the page where it is, I'll put a picture of it up on screen, but someone asks him where his music or where his guitar licks, his solos come from, and he answers that he doesn't really know. And I was like, yeah, exactly, man. Exactly, my dude. Then there was another part in this book that I absolutely adored describing the creative process or the making process that I put a short clip of in my screen time video but I'm just gonna read it again right here because I love it so much and I think it sums up what natural creation feels like. I think it sums up what creating naturally feels like in a flow. Art is unbiddable. All you can do is signal your readiness. Wrong turns, eliminated, reveal the right path. Elf carries on, linking rightness with the next rightness along. Art is sideways, art is diagonal. She tries flipping it, playing bass arpeggios with a treble overlay. Art is tricks of the light. That whole section is truly beautiful and really sums up what I've experienced. To sum it up, I cried at the end of this book. I cried like a baby. You should read it. It's good. Something I've mentioned several times on my channel, a challenge that I'm just trying to do for no real reason other than I want to, is read Kurt Vonnegut's published bibliography of novels. I read two of the novels in his bibliography during this challenge. I read Mother Night and Cat's Cradle. I do have my own copy of Mother Night, and I just, I'm so in love with the color blue on this cover. Kind of reminds me of Vegeta's uniform, sort of. Not my favorite Vonnegut novel so far. I liked it, but was not my favorite. I think I actually rated this three out of five stars, and if I did the half point system, I'd probably rate it a 3.5. I know it's satire, and I think it does a great job of showing human complexity. I think all of his novels really do that well. This one, more so because of all the ethical and moral problems that it presents and the whole time, I was uncomfortable with all of those quandaries, which I think is the purpose. And I appreciate that purpose. I appreciate a book where its purpose is to make you uncomfortable for the purpose of thinking, for the purpose of pondering not just to be disturbing. Because what else is satire except to actually make you think about reality and the ridiculousness of it and its complexities? Basic, very, very basic synopsis of this book. This guy is on trial as a war criminal from World War II in Israel. I don't think I have to spell out for you what that means if he's considered a war criminal from World War II. But he was also a spy for the Americans. He was a double agent. That is where the moral and ethic quandaries come in. Literature people do not come for me. I am not an English major. I am not a literature scholar. I study music and I study history, okay? I don't have all the fancy terms to describe the satire and metaphors and all that jazz of this book. Even though it wasn't my favorite plot-wise, I still love Vonnegut's writing in this book because like good satire, it is very good writing in the way that it makes you think and it makes you hooked into the story and makes you want to know what happens next. There were certainly enough twists in this story that I sort of saw coming but didn't really see coming. And something different about it, I'm one of those people where if I know the ending already, like if you tell me the ending at the beginning, I just don't care. This is an exception to the rule. Because it starts out with him in the Israeli prison waiting to go on trial, you pretty much know what the ending is gonna be. At least you have a pretty good darn idea. But the way that the ending was introduced, it hooked me into seeing how it all started and how we got to this point in time. I think it's really short reading. I think it's very accessible. I Honestly, I think all of Vonnegut so far has been truly, truly accessible. So if you're looking for classics that are funny and make you think and have really good writing, easy to understand writing, I recommend Vonnegut. I love the descriptions in this book. I love the humor in this book. Something particular that I love about Vonnegut's writing is his character descriptions. That can range from just, they're unorthodox the way you describe them. It's not just the, they have blue eyes and amber hair. No, 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 no. He always describes things, not only characters, but things and emotions in the most unconventional ways, I think. And that always surprises me. As for Cat's Cradle, I enjoyed it slightly more than Mother Night. The basic synopsis of that book is the main character is an author trying to write a book about where 
important people were on the day that the atom bombs were dropped. This leads him to the family of one of the scientists who worked on the bombs in order to get the story about where their dad was on the day that it dropped, his reactions, that sort of thing. And, um, he never writes the book. I'll just say that. In fact, the entire world changes in a sort of ironic fashion. Needless to say, it is a buck wild book that kept the pages turning because I just could not believe what was happening from one page to the next as different secrets were revealed or different people said things that then caused a chain reaction of other things to happen. And it's just, it's like watching a train wreck happen in slow motion where you know something bad is coming you don't know exactly what it's gonna look like when it does happen. You have a decently good idea, but you're still like, mm, I gotta, I gotta see. I gotta see. So you keep watching. Now, that book was really funny. Mother Night was funny too, but Cat's Cradle is really funny. And it's in Cat's Cradle that I started noticing patterns. Well, actually, I started noticing in Mother Night. But in all the Von Vonnegut books that I've read so far, I've noticed three things. Three common traits in a Vonnegut novel. Now, literature scholars, you can tell me if I'm wrong. This is just a good old country girl's observation. Rule number one, if there's a dog, it will die. Rule number two, if there is a mother figure, she will often be flawed, but basically a saint. Number three, if there is a father figure, he will be the most worthless piece of trash you've ever seen in your life. Maybe with some good intentions, but as a father, he sucks. So, dog death, saintly mother, problematic father. I feel like I'm becoming my old professor who is a prominent scholar of a particular author. I feel like I'm channeling a little bit of him. Like, he's, he's like, channeling into me to, like, discover this stuff about Vonnegut. And I'm not sure how I feel about it. Anyway, if you like cults or islands or ice, read Cat's Cradle, Dracula. I don't know why I was intimidated to read this book for so long. I don't know. I felt like it was going to be really hard to read because of the language. I felt like it was going to be, I hate to say antiquated because that's a little bit too old, but just more difficult language. And it really, really wasn't. It was really easy to read. I flew through it. It's very fast paced. It's very funny. It's very interesting. It's a classic for a reason. My only complaint, and this just has to do with I don't think the writing, I think it just has to do with the customs at the time, which I can't fault it for because in that way it's very accurate. I just find it very annoying. The characters spend about, like, 20% of this book is characters groveling over the other characters. They're like, Oh, this person is so nice, and but they're so wonderful, and they're so honorable, and they're so honest. Every single page at least has, like, a sentence or two of a character talking about another character that way. And I'm like, okay, I get it. You simp for him. Calm down. Can we get to the, can we get to the stabby stab with the, you know, the, you know, can, can we? Cool. So besides all these old people licking the ground other people walk on, I would recommend this book as a classic book that's pretty easy to read. That being said, I read this book after I read another Dracula book, and I'm actually glad that I read that other Dracula book before this one because I feel like it made this one a lot more fun. But now saying that, because I can't go back in time and read them in the reverse order, it's sort of like the chicken before the egg. And that other book is the Dracula tape. Pretty self-explanatory. Dracula traps himself in the back of these people's car in a snowstorm and starts recording his life story on their tape recorder machine. Gosh, isn't that just every little girl's dream? What is Vlad talking about in this tape recording that he's making? He's basically fed up with all the lies surrounding his life story and what actually happened in the Dracula tale, and he is here to set things right. The reason I think this helped me enjoy the actual Dracula more is because of the context and the sassiness that I put into my brain. There's a lot of things in Dracula that just don't make sense to me, and they're addressed in here. Basically, everything that doesn't make sense in Dracula or has a little bit of questionability to it is addressed in here. It was just funny to see things that were so dramatic in Dracula with them like holding out the crucifixes and the crosses to be explained away so easily in here. 
it was basically like, you ever have that friend who they go on a trip and they come back and they're like, oh, dude, we got in this bar fight and, or like, I caught this fish and they just over-exaggerate the entire story and you're sitting there kind of like, mm-hmm, yeah, mm-hmm. And then you talk to another friend who was with them and they're like, mm -hmm, no, here's how it actually went down. That's the vibe of this book. This book is the friend that says, no, this is actually how it happened. This book is freaking hilarious. I highly recommend it. Again, it's a very accessible read. Part of what this book does really well is grounding the other book because it doesn't explain away the entire Dracula story. It agrees with a lot of it. It just says, here's the parts that they got wrong. Where you're reading this and you're like, yeah, that makes perfect sense of what he actually experienced. Like, I believe that you could read these side by side and get a cohesive story. In fact, considering that's what I did and I had a great time with it, that's what I recommend you do. The Dracula tape and Dracula, just read them as companions side by side. Personally, I love how sassy Dracula is because he's going through all the fight scenes in Dracula, right? Where they're like, oh, this ugly, hideous monster, like, shrank back from us. You know, he was terrified. And then here he's like, yeah. That's because you guys, like, smelled of sweat and dirt, and you smelled disgusting. Like, of course I'm gonna, like, reel back. And I was like, sir, okay. Sass Master Tepish, I understand. Snow White with the Red Hair, Volume 4. It's probably my favorite of the series so far, simply because we get more backstory on Zen and Mitsu's origin story as friends, and Mitsu, which is what I call him, he's one of my favorite characters next to Obi, so getting to see how he met Zen and how he got to where he is now, being a sassy little gremlin, loved it, adored it. And if you've seen the video, you know that Obi is a man after my own heart in this book. I'm also glad they clarified the ages of the characters in this book, because I was beginning to feel weird not knowing what ages they are, not because I'm like drooling over them or simping over them or anything, but I was just like, I don't know how to really picture them in my brain, like talking or acting. I'm like, how old are they? Are they like 13 or are they like 20? Glad this cleared it up because once they said the ages, I was like, that makes a lot more sense. I think Obi's like 21 and Mitsu's like 23. He's like my age. I was like, that makes sense. That makes a lot more sense. But it was funny, Obi was a little gremlin, so was Mitsu. We also got a little bit of Zen's tragic backstory. I'm excited to see how this develops into the future volumes because I feel like Obi may become a problematic fave. I just, I have a feeling that he may become problematic. As in, like, to the other characters in the book, not actually, like, being cancelable or anything. Indiana Jones and the White Witch. Wasn't sure how I was going to feel about this book because I feel like when there are books made about a certain franchise where its key universe is not in the literary canon but it's in the cinematic canon, it can often just be for a cash grab. Then again, that may be my cynical view on today's media rather than when these were actually published. Either way, I wasn't disappointed about this book. It was really fun, actually. I actually finished this book, which is like 400 and something, almost 400 pages, faster than I did a little like 200 page book, just because I was that into it. It kept me that engrossed. It had the formula of an Indiana Jones movie, so if that's your vibe, you'll probably dig this book. This book has a lot to do with Wicca. Wicca is a central part of this book. And I was pleasantly surprised at the exploration and discussion of Wicca in this book. It wasn't treated as ooh hoo fantastical beliefs that are just, mmm, taboo or just spicy enough. I think it was actually treated with a lot of respect and in a mature way. Indiana had questions, of course, but it was also very fitting for him being an archaeologist and a historian. I don't think he asked the questions that were prodding or mocking or making fun. I think they were questions that made sense. And I think there was a good healthy dose of disbelief or skepticism, but skepticism, again, that wasn't mocking or making fun of. I enjoyed the way that the relationship between what they refer to as, you know, the magic and the relationship of nature was discussed and explained to other people. As someone that was raised in Appalachia, around a lot of folk craft and also having Scottish and native ancestors. The relationship between magic and nature is something that's really important to me, something really important to my family and cultural history. To, to see it be discussed in such a mature and respectful way was refreshing. 
Also, I think it's just something that's not explored enough as a subject in modern media. Sure, King Arthur and all them, blah 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 blah, ancient, ancient stuff. But come on. I want to see more folk craft stuff. I want to see more Wicca tales. Done in a respectful way. I want to see more exploring those cultures, exploring those beliefs, because they are so fascinating and so steeped in history. I think it can be done. Obviously it can be, and I think it can be done well, and I think this book is a good example of how. The Martian by Andy Weir. This book is so funny to me. I don't know the general consensus people have about this book and their feelings on it. I absolutely adored this book. It is one of the only books that I can remember that made me actually laugh out loud as much as it did. There's one, there's one part in particular that had me almost in tears. I was laughing so hard out loud. And Mark, if you don't know this book, Mark is a botanist. He's one of the best botanists in the world. That's why he was chosen for this mission. And basically when he establishes contact back with NASA, they're like, hey, we're gonna get some botanists over here to make sure that the little farm that you're growing is good. That like, you covered all your bases, there are no errors. And Mark is like, you're gonna get these fools in here trying to tell me how to do my job? Why you hired me? I'm not taking it. So he gets an email back from Kapoor. And it says, Mark, some answers to your earlier questions. No, we will not tell our botany team to go f themselves. This book is so funny. <laughs> I truly felt for Mark Watney in this book because I believe more than half the crap he did or half of the way he reacted to things is exactly the way I would have done so. When he's like, especially when he's like, oh my gosh, I have this problem. I, I think I got it figured out. And he goes into this whole detailed plan of how he's going to figure it out. And then the next log entry is, oh God, I forgot this one crucial minor detail. I'm going to die. Two days later, next entry, everything's fine. <laughs> Turns out I overreacted, and I'm like, yeah, relatable content, Mark. Relatable content. Now, I am not a science or a space person, so space nerds don't come for me, but I loved the details and problem solving in this book. I am a person that loves to know every detail of how something works and why it works that way. This book provides plenty of that. He goes into the details about the capabilities of each piece of equipment that he has to use or the science that he's going to use and the rationale behind it. He goes into the chemistry, the mechanics, the engineering, the if, ands, or buts for different problem solvings that he's going to be using the object for. Whether those details, the science is accurate, I don't know. Someone else can tell me I can probably Google it, but I don't care, to be honest. I just enjoyed having an explanation. Because if you were in a survival situation like that, that's how you would have to think about things. That's how you would have to engineer things, is by thinking about the probability and the makeup and capability of whatever resources you have. I think it makes perfect sense. So I don't really care if it's accurate or not, as long as it works for the book. It was easy, it was fun to read, very, very funny. Highly, 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 highly recommend. Second to last book is Low Anthropology by David Zoll. This is the first sort of sociology, psychology, social science, anthropology book that I've ever read, I think. At least that wasn't for school, that I've read on my own. And I actually picked this book up, not because I had heard of it, but because I worked sound for a book signing that he did in my hometown. Anyway, I picked this book up after hearing him talk about it because it was so interesting to me. And I'm not going to even try and sum up the points that are made in this book except for a few key ones because I will just do it in injustice. I think that everyone should read this book. I think that everyone should pick up this book. Look, it's, it's very easy to read. It's very short. Extremely accessible to the everyday person. That being said, I will give a slight warning. Not really a warning about this book, but it is written by a Christian man. It is written by a staff member of a church, but, 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 you don't have to be religious or have any sort of religion to read this book. Do you hear me? That's key. Being religious is not a qualifier for this book. I think you will get just as much out of this book if you are religious or not religious. I just want to make that clear just to let y'all know before you pick it up and you're like, wait, why is it mentioning Jesus in some chapters? Why is it, a, why is it mentioning the Bible? You didn't tell me this was a, this was a Christian book. Yes, it has Christian themes in it, but they're not the key to the book. You can get just as much out of this, even if you are not religious 
whatsoever. It just uses religion to discuss some of the ideas in a different context or relate them to different verses in a Bible for the people that want it. But for the people that aren't religious or don't want that, there's plenty of other contexts and examples in here that you will be able to relate to that are very everyday, very common. Okay, I said I wasn't going to sum up the points for this book, but I will tell you I love this book because it is so real and yet it is so kind. Basically, it talks about how to view ourselves and each other with a lot of grace and realism because we're not perfect. We're capable of great things, but no matter what we do, there's never going to be a magic formula for helping us capture our highest potential in everything we want to do all of the time. We are going to fall short, we're going to fail, we're going to be rude sometimes, we're going to be mean sometimes, we're going to have days where we just lounge and we're a couch potato. And a lot of self-care or a lot of productivity gurus will tell you, you just need to change your routine, you just need to do this, you just need to do that, and then poof, everything will be fixed. And that's just not real. It just, it does not exist. We're humans. We're fallible. We're imperfect. And it's okay. And the quicker we realize that, the sooner we can be kind to ourselves and actually work on the things that we can change in order to continually better ourselves. But to expect perfection all of the time is a losing battle. It also talks about while having that gracious view of yourself, having the gracious view towards others as well, because you recognize it's not just you, it's also them. We're all imperfect together. We're all just meat suits flying on this giant rock in space. Last but not least, we have The Slow Regard of Silent Things by Patrick Rothfuss, the companion novella to the Kingkiller Chronicles. It basically follows one of the characters in the series, I hate to call her a side character, but I guess she kind of is a side character. In this book, she's the main character, as she deserves to be. She lives down below the university that the main character in the main series attends. This book follows her throughout a week, I'm pretty sure it is, and just her daily routines, how she feels about things, how she sees the world, which she's an interesting character in the main series that I just absolutely adored and I wanted to know more about her. I'm very glad this book was published for that purpose because I love her so, so, so much. Also, this book has adorable illustrations throughout the pages that are never, like, full page, I don't think, but they just add to the story. I really think they do. I related to this character a lot more than I thought I would. I don't know if it's part of my neurodivergent brain, and it's hard to explain unless you've read this book. She has a feeling for things. She can see an object and she can like hear it talking to her. It's obviously not talking to her, but she gets feelings, resonances from them about where they want to be. Like this book feels like it's in the wrong room, so it needs to be taken to another room. It won't tell her exactly really where it wants to be, but she'll know when she takes it there. And then it'll feel like, well, I want to sit next to the piggy bank on the floor. And so she'll put it down on the piggy bank on the floor. I realize how ridiculous I'm going to sound. I understand it. <laughs> I have never heard it put in words before, but I understand that feeling because I experience it as well. Not to the extent that she does, not to the I need to move things, this thing belongs in this room or this thing belongs next to this other object, but in the sense of objects having their own auras or resonances, I understand that when things just feel off or they feel like in the, they're in the right place place. Again, not as detailed as her as they need to be in a different room, but something will just feel off to me. I don't know if it's my pattern recognition, pattern analysis, whatever, but I, I specifically feel it whenever I need to declutter an object. I'll feel like I'm hurting an object's feelings if I get rid of it. I know that's crazy, but I do. I feel like, oh, I'm gonna hurt this object's, this inanimate object's feelings. <laughs> I just relate to her and I love her and I feel so validated and seen. That's going to be all for this book review. Wow, I have hair standing in the... Stop that. Back to your seats, madams. That's going to be all for this book review. I hope you found something that interests you. I hope you pick up one of these books. Please let me know if you do. I'd be interested in your thoughts on them. If you like videos like this, book reviews, book challenges, boy howdy. I have a whole playlist for you of every book video that I have ever done. But wait, there's more. I promise I will be making a lot more book videos in the future as well because... <laughs> You might be surprised, but I like reading. I know, I know. Hold your applause. I'm special. But as for now, thank you so much for watching. 
I really appreciate it. And if you haven't heard it from anyone else today, I love you. Love and peace. Till tomorrow. <laughs>